Slackware is by a very short margin the longest running Linux distro, beating Debian by a few short months. But Slackware isn't the first Linux distro really by any definition of the term. In fact, there are five distros and two other things which you may or may not consider a distro depending on your definition. So let's go back and lay those projects out. And where better to start than right at the start? Now the generally agreed upon first distro, this is where we start getting into the weirdness, is MCC Interim Linux. But I posit another option. From November 4th, 1991, Linus Torvalds Linux boot images. This first began with Linux 0.10. Unlike a modern distro, or really anything we would generally consider a distro, this required you to do basically everything yourself. What I mean is you had to bootstrap the system from an existing Minix or other Unix or Unix-like system. You had to go make your file system, bring the tooling over, basically everything besides compile the kernel. Upon getting the kernel onto your system, you could then use another system to set up everything around the kernel to give yourself an actual useful system. Now, the reason why I'm calling this a distro is going by the strictest definition of what a distro is. A distribution of the Linux kernel. And by that definition, this is distributing the kernel, but nothing more than that. Now, Torvald didn't maintain this for its entire lifespan. Eventually, it was handed over to Jim Winstead Jr. with the 0.95a release on March 17th, 1992. Now, as this project progressed, additional tooling was being added. Eventually, there was a shell. Eventually, you had things like TAR, you had PFDisk, and it was slowly becoming a distribution. But by this point, another distro had already arisen. That being the commonly accepted first Linux distro, MCC Interim Linux by Omen LeBlanc in February of 1992. MCC stands for Manchester Computing Center. Now, like many projects of the time, it was either one, named after the person who made it, like Linux for example, or two, named after the place it was made, this being the latter. This was created for computer users who were not Unix experts. And going by what it was following, you can see why that's how it's been described. This included some revolutionary concepts like a menu-driven installer and the GNU user space tooling. This provided a stable base system which can be installed in a short time and to which other software can be added with relatively little effort. And also, Owen is one of the two people responsible for porting FDisk over to Linux. And even though it was really basic, you can see how this all comes together as what we commonly call a distro. With one very big exception, it didn't have a package manager. Updating was done entirely manually. But it did bring something really cool to the table, a centralized location for all of your updates to be stored. Basically, a package repo. Previously, if you wanted to update any of the software on your system, you would have to go and pull that software from the individual project's FTP server, which, you know, is fine if you know where all of your software comes from, but as you start adding more and more and more software into your system, it becomes completely unmanageable. Imagine we had a modern Linux system without a package repo. MCC was very much an experimental concept, never really intended to be this widespread thing. So it didn't include some very basic software like X386, more commonly just called X386, the X11 server of the time. So if you wanted to install that, well, you're basically on your own. Following this, we have a distro that people tend to forget. The exact starting date is a little bit unclear, but the closest I've gotten to is May of 1992. This is TAMU, or T-A-M-U, from the Texas A&M University. Once again, this is literally just named after the place it was made. Take the first letter of each word, and there you go, TAMU. Not much is recorded online about this distro, but it did have one really interesting idea. It was the first distro to ship an X11 server, that being X386. 
our next Linux distro may be the most important Linux distro that you've probably never heard of. That being Soft Landing Linux System, or SLS for short. This was created by Peter McDonald on August 15th, 1992, with the absolutely incredible slogan, Gentle Touchdown for DOS Bailouts. This was the most comprehensive Linux distro for the time, and its popularity reflected that. Whilst being fairly minimal by today's standards, it included all of the basic things you would now expect, like the GNU user space tooling, some additional basic utilities, the X window system, all of which were still not guaranteed on every system you use. The problem is nobody really knew how to maintain a Linux distro yet, and because of the additional software, this led to it being perceived as fairly buggy and poorly maintained. But this is what spawned two absolutely incredible projects. The first being Slackware, which was originally created as a cleanup of soft landing Linux by Patrick Volkerding, along with Ian Murdoch being basically frustrated with the system and going and creating Debian. Another often forgotten distro is DLD, Deutsche Linux Distribution. Unlike Tamu, this one does have a Wikipedia page. This is the entire page, also it's in German. So, yeah. This was created by Delix Computer GmbH, founded by Dyer Hager, Niels Macher, and Jen Zeman. There's not really much else known about it, but its claim to fame is it's the very first German Linux distribution, and also happens to be one of the many Linux distributions pretty much completely lost to time. The next project we have may be or may not be a Linux distro. This was HG Lu's bootable root disk from September 23rd, 1992, and then a bit later, the Linux-based system from October 2nd, 1993. So the bootable root disk isn't really a distro in a sense. It's more like a thing that you can run to then install the Linux kernel, install all of the tooling you need. Basically, it gives you a thing to get everything set up without having to go and run Minix or something else like that. And then the Linux base system is all of the additional tooling you're going to want to install. So if you pair them together, basically you have a Linux distro installer, but they are two separate entities. In the rare cases where other people are interested in looking at this, I've seen some people confuse this with Linus Torvald's boot images. Those are a completely separate project, and this didn't exist until long after Linus had stopped maintaining those. But I can see how they get confused. They are very much a similar concept and not what we would generally consider a distro nowadays. Even something as basic as Arch Linux, you can at least go and use to like do basic computing with before you install it. Our final project is very much a Linux distro. This was the very first commercial Linux distro. Maybe DLD was also commercial, but the model was very much unclear. This was Yggdrasil Linux slash GNU slash X. I am not joking, that's the actual name. I've joked about how if we're going to call it GNU Linux, you should list out all of the other software on your system, but apparently they were already doing it back in December 8th of 1992. This distro was created by Yggdrasil Computing Incorporated, founded by Adam J. Richter. Software-wise, it's really nothing crazy to mention. The tooling that became expected on SLS was also present here, including X, but minus the bad maintainership. Yggdrasil Linux was a well-maintained distro, which you should expect if you're actually paying money for it. This distro had some crazy requirements, requiring 8 megabytes of RAM and 100 megabytes of storage. A beta got released with a price tag of 60 USD. When the production version came out, this was 99 USD. However, if you were a maintainer of a package on the CD, you could just get a copy for free. Because, you know, you need to be able to test it for their distro, so they thought, why would we charge the developers? Just let them have it. For those who are going to buy Yggdrasil Linux, you could either get in contact with the company directly, or in some cases, it was available in stores. Now, the company did continue for quite a while, around the year 2000. By this point, though, it very much fell out of favour as companies like SUSE and Red Hat started to form. So that is every single distro and 
other things that are kind of distro-like before Slackware and Debian. There may have been other things, but if they did exist, they're certainly not documented on the internet. I spent way too long looking into this video, so hopefully you learnt something new. Maybe you know about soft landing Linux system, maybe you know about MCC, but I hope there was at least one system you didn't know about. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Have you been around since the start of Linux? Did you happen to use one of these systems, or maybe you've used a system based on one of these systems like say Debian or Slackware? I would love to know. So if you like the video, go like the video, and if you really like the video and you want to become one over, these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe to the Liberapay link in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and technically, Yggdrasil Linux had an even longer name. Yggdrasil Linux GNU X Plug and Play Linux. <laughs>